My introduction is going to be really brief. My name is Ken Rogers. I work at UTS in Sydney, and I'm interested in the causes of motor neuron disease. So I'd like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to talk here. And I would like to thank them for giving me such a difficult topic and 15 minutes to cover it. But there have been some interesting things happened in our understanding of motor neuron disease over the past few years. So genes and environment, the different causes of motor neuron disease. So we want to understand what causes motor neuron disease. A good place to start is the MND Australia website. And what it says there is about 90 to 95 percent of MND cases are sporadic. So for most people with MND, the diagnosis comes out of the blue, no family history. <coughs> like heart disease, diabetes, it's a complex disease influenced by many genetic and environmental risk factors. So we could represent it like this, where we've got about 10% where you've got a family history, and you've got 90% where it's complex genes, environment, that kind of stuff. If we have a look around the website, we'll find something else in MND Australia. We'll find this graph showing that the highest prevalence is about 70. So there's not much MND in these early years, and then it increases and peaks around 70. So that's telling us one other thing about MND. Time is a factor. So we can now have a model where we've got genes, time, and environment interacting. So maybe it's genes and time, maybe it's genes, environment, and time, maybe it's environment and time. So I was asked to talk about some of the great work done by Professor Amal Al-Chalabi. And this is the first paper he published in 2013 with um, Hardiman. And it was called The Epidemiology of ALS, A Conspiracy of Genes, Environment, and Time. So that's pretty much where we were at in that last schematic. And these guys proposed three different models. And I'm just going to talk to you about one. So here we have, on this axis, we have health. So this is good health. And here we have the burden of disease-causing factors. So with time, until we get to this, what is called the threshold, where you get the onset of uh, MND or ALS, a couple of things we want to point out. I'm just going to interchange ALS, MND. And another thing I'd like to point out, I'm a scientist, I'm not a clinician. So this is a scientist's perspective on the causes of MND. So, when you're born, you may be born with a genetic susceptibility to MND. Throughout your life, you can get in genetic, fact, genetic susceptibility to environmental factors. So there's some environmental factors that will only affect you if you've got some genetic susceptibility. We've got time. We know time's an equation. And maybe we've got some environmental factors that you don't need any genetic susceptibility to. And once you get to this threshold, the disease onset, begins. So that was one of the models they proposed, which is an interaction of genes, environment, and time. The, the following year, what these guys did, so it was the same guy, Professor Al Chalabi, and a different bunch of people, and they decided to use a mathematical model to work out how many steps were involved. And this was pretty weird, because what they used was a mathematical model from 1954. And this mathematical model was all about how many steps does it take for a normal cell to become a cancerous cell? How many mutations on average does it take for a normal cell to turn into a cancer cell? And they used this model, and Al Shalabi and colleagues applied this model to MND or ALS. And what they did is they used five registers from Europe, and they plotted the age where people were diagnosed with MND. So it's the age against the instance of MND at each of these age groups. And they did a bit of mathematical trickery, and they ended up doing this plot here. And what we've got here is the log of age and the log of instance, and it was a straight line, which matched what Armitage and Doe did in 1954. And when you work out the slope of that straight line, the slope is 5. And the mathematical modeling means that there are six steps. So you take the slope and you add on one, and that's how many steps. So these guys postulated from this that MND or ALS could be a six-step process. I'm going to explain how that works, because if you look at that, you go, how can you possibly plot the log of the age against the log of the instance and work out how many steps there are in a disease? They also said that this cannot be taken as definitive proof. 
that ELS is a multi-step process. But the interesting thing is, for each of these registers, they got the same result. I'm going to try and explain that by telling you a little bit of a story. Early this year, I was lucky enough to visit Paul Cox's lab in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. So this is his lab in Wyoming. It's a great spot. This is Jackson Hole. We can't see it very well, but it's just in there. It's got skiing in winter. It's got mountain biking in summer. It's got um, kayaking in summer. A fantastic place. One afternoon, I decided I was going to get on a mountain bike and hit a few trails. When I had the mountain bike, I was all set to go, and a woman said to me, do you have any bear spray? I was going, what, what is that? She goes, well, you spray it in bear's eyes. So I, go, I wasn't expecting to meet any bears. She goes, oh, there's bears out there. And it's a pepper spray. So if you meet a bear, you just spray it in the eyes with a pepper spray. Sure enough, when I get out in the tracks, there it goes. Don't listen to headphones. There could be a bear behind you. <laughs> the thing that really scared me was, she said, when you're going through the tracks when the grass is up to here, make a lot of noise so the bears know you're there. So the reason I'm telling you this story is there were two elements to risk. There was the risk associated with the bears themselves. How many bears? Are they hungry? Are they looking after their young? Are they aggressive? So there were risks associated with the bears, but there's also risks associated with my exposure to the bears. Because I was only going out in the tracks for about three hours. That was minimal exposure to that risk. However, if I'd lived there, I might do that every weekend. So my exposure to the risk would obviously increase. So the point I'm trying to make is that the instance of people being killed by bears was a, was a combination of the risk of a bear attack. So that's got to do with the bears themselves, but it was also the exposure to the bears. So how many people are out on these tracks? That, that would affect the instance of the bear attack. And that's basically the way this model works. Because age is your exposure, sorry, age is your exposure to risk factors. So the longer you live, the more chance you are of encountering these as yet completely, not completely understood risk factors. And this is the instance of MND. So that's how it works. This is really the chances, the years you've got exposed to these risk factors. This was the, the last study they did, and this was done this year. They did it to another register, and again, they got a straight line. And as we all know, the slope was five, so that means six steps. They went one stage further than this. What they did is they had enough patients to divide them into familial and non-familial. So what they found is in all cases and all sporadic cases, the steps were six. So you can see there, the slope is five, the steps are six. When it came to familial cases, it went down to four. So if you're born with that familial gene that other family members would have had, you only need four steps. And in fact, if you look further at various mutations, you can see for some, like the SOD1 mutated one, you only need two steps. So what's going to happen if you've got one of these mutations? You need fewer steps, and that's going to take less time. So the onset of these diseases is going to be faster than this, because you need less time to get the rest of the steps. A few people are nodding. So I think my bear analogy might have worked a little bit. <laughs> OK, so how can we identify these environmental risk factors? They're obviously really important. So two ways we can identify them. One is examine clusters of MND. So let's say the instance of MND is pretty much the same all over the world. But somewhere, there's a really high instance of MND. If we can work out it's not genetic, it's going to tell us something about environmental risk factors. The other one is compare the instance in two populations. Obvious example is male-female. The instance in male is higher than females. So you can do this for anything. Anything you suspect, whether it be exposures to plastics, to metals, to whatever you like, you can compare the instance in two populations. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the clusters of MND, because this is something I'm really interested in. So in, this is just a summary paper that was published um, about a month ago, where it's documented um, geographical clusters of MND. And the thing about most of these is they've got to do with cycad seeds, BMA, seafood, and algal blooms, which just happens to be what I'm interested in. So what about 
clusters in Australia. No one has shown yet that there are any clusters, but if you talk to neurologists, they'll tell you that in certain areas of Australia, they think there could be more people with MND than there should be. So I'm going to tell you the story of Guam. Guam is this island in the South Pacific. You can see here it's um, pretty close to Japan, Hong Kong, um, above Port Moresby. And when it used to be um, Portuguese, the Portuguese discovered it, and then it became Japanese, and eventually it became American. And what the Americans did there was build a naval base. And after World War II, there was a lot of American um, physicians going there, and they, sorry, they worked out that there was a hundredfold increase in ALS, Parkinson's, dementia, compared with the rest of the world. This is a hot spot, right? So there's identified a hot spot of motor neuron disease, or, and it also had Parkinson's, it also had dementia in this island. It had a very sort of unique and primitive lifestyle, but as soon as the Americans got there, they really adopted the American way of life. And in fact, at one point, they suggested changing the name to Guamerica. That's how, much, that's how much they went for the American way of life. But what actually happened is this instance of increased instance of disease disappeared, which was another piece of evidence that was got to do with some sort of environmental factors here that disappeared here. To cut a long story short, the lab I went to in Jackson Hole was run by a guy called Paul Cox, and he was involved in so much of this story. So on the island, they had these cycad palms. They had cycad forests. The seeds in the palm, if you take the inside out here, you can make flour, and from the flour you can make tortillas. So the people were eating a lot of these tortillas. And someone called Marjorie Whitting brought some of this back to England, and she said, I think this might contain a toxin called BOAA. When it was analyzed, they couldn't find any, because this BOA is connected to lathyrism, but they did find BMA, which was a new amino acid. And Paul Cox and colleagues also found that it wasn't being made by cyanobacteria, by um, the cycad palms, it was being made by cyanobacteria in the roots. So if you cut, cut the roots of these cycad palms, you can see they've got this green. Cyanobacteria is the stuff you see on waterways, blue-green algae. And another weird thing is the people in Guam loved fruit bat soup. You get a fruit bat, you shampoo it, you boil it in coconut milk for two hours, uh, actually six hours, six hours, and then you eat the lot. And what actually happened is this chemical was being concentrated in the fruit bats. There was lots of ways they were getting lots of this chemical, and it was potentially causing neurological disease. I could talk about 100 studies showing various aspects of the toxicity of this chemical, but what I'm just going to say is that in New Hampshire, USA, which was another one of these on the, the cluster list, they showed that living near lakes with algal blooms increases your risk 25-fold if you live within a mile of a lake with um, regular algal blooms. So I'm just going to mention a few studies that I've actually done, I've been involved in, and this was one that was funded by MND RIA, and what we, no one had ever looked in Australia for this BMA molecule. And what we did is we sampled 14 sites around New South Wales. We collected the blooms, took them back to the lab, dried them down, processed them, and worked out that nine out of the 14 contained high levels of BMA. And what we've gone on to do now, which should be published later this year, is we collected the blooms. This is um, Jake collecting the blooms. You take them back to the lab, and from a single cyanobacteria, you grow them into a, a bloom in the lab and then you can work out which cyanobacteria are capable of producing these toxins. So that was funded by MNDRIA, and we've really taken that further, and we now know which blooms contain these toxic cyanobacteria. Another study was uh, MNDRIA funded, I worked out it was probably seven years ago, was this study here where we are given money to work out how toxic BMA was to neurons in, in culture. And another interesting thing we found, that L-serine, which is a dietary amino acid, was protective. So this was the first link between BMA and L-serine. And what actually happened was, from that point, lots of other studies, studies in, in monkeys, studies in, in various species, cell studies, the lot, confirmed this link between L-serine being protective. And Paul Cox managed to set up this phase one study 
And it's basically a safety study. So people were taking different doses of l serine for six, six months, but at the same time, they looked at the ALS scores, and you can see this is a general population. There's this decline in six months. The patients on the high dose l serine showed much less decline. So this has now moved on to a phase two clinical trial. So basically, it illustrates a really good point that by initiating a cell culture study here, there was a link between BME and l serine It led to lots of other studies, and it led to um, a clinical trial. So the second one is this um, comparing two populations. And I'm going to be very quick here. And I'm, I used this study here, which was published um, about a, a few months ago. So what you do is you compare the instance of MND in two populations. And I'm just going to summarize it here. These were the things they looked at. They looked at it was occupational exposure, so heavy physical work, professional sports, metals, chemicals, electromagnetic fields. This is the, the increase in risk. These are the studies, and this is significant. So all of these are pretty highly significant. And the way it works is what you do is you've got your two populations. So here were people who do heavy physical work. This is one. If they're on this side of the line, it's an increased risk. Here we have professional sports. This side of the line, increased risks. So what you see is for professional sports, physical, heavy physical work, increased risk of MND. Now people, it's highly significant from a statistical point of view, but people don't really take it that seriously because it's such a small change. But when you think about the Al-Shalabi studies, it's like six factors involved, six steps involved in MND. So obviously when you look at a single factor, you're not going to see a really spectacular change. So for me, this looks like something that is actually real. When it comes to something like heart disease, everybody knows high cholesterol, high blood pressure, lack of exercise, obesity, they all contribute to the chances of having a heart attack. So I think when we think about MND, we've got to think about these small things all contributing to some endpoint. So take home message, an understanding of the environmental contribution to MND is essential since it's the only easily modifiable component of the overall risk. That was a quote from Al Shalabi paper. And what worries me slightly is we know this is true, but I think we're slightly ignoring this factor here. And I think we might end up with something that looks a little bit like this. So we've got the genes handled, but we really don't know too much about these factors here. So, Sorry I went a minute or two over time. I'd like to thank these people I've been working with, and I would like to um, thank you for listening and invite any questions. Thanks very much.